So, well, welcome to our Westbridge Educational Night presentation. Uh, as Donna said, we're playing off the theme of the old classic TV show Sequest and the current <laughs> state of affairs, we decided to call it Sequestered. <laughs> the images we're sharing tonight are mostly recent work since we last presented about underwater photography to the club about five years ago. We've been scuba diving for about 38 years, shooting underwater photography for about 36. This is an older photo of the four B guns, Frank and Audrey with our camera setups and our two daughters who are the best critter spotters on the reef. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the equipment. Uh, what we use for underwater photography has really evolved significantly over the years. We first started with a single Nikonos V film camera and strobe. Um, for those of you who remember what film is, we, we use that. Um, the greatest limitation we dealt with uh, back then was the film. Uh, you went underwater with 36 possible shots and you had to ration your shots uh, to try ending up uh, when the end of the roll was done, uh, that needed to coincide with the end of your tank of air and your dive. Uh, second limitation uh, with the early cameras was that we did not have through the lens viewfinders. So in composing your shot, you had to compensate uh, for the viewfinder being situated a bit above the lens. I think that's referred to as parallax. Uh, related to that, if you forgot to remove the lens cap, you wouldn't know it by looking through the viewfinder. Third, uh, the single strobe tended to cast shadows, especially on close-up images. Fourth, we love macro photography. And with this early camera, because the depth of field was so narrow, you had to get just the right size critter to hold still. We used to use framing bars. And it, you had to get it to hold still within the plane, right in the center of the focusing brackets. And if you think fish are going to hang around when you stick that near them, um, you're sorely mistaken. Uh, despite all these frustrations, we really enjoyed uh, these cameras for many years. They were state of the art. We made the leap to digital around 2005 when we got Nikon cameras and lenses that we could place in a customized Aquatica housing. We were able to use dual strobes. Um, customized means that the housing is built um, kind of around the camera to the specifications of that particular camera body. So all the cameras, buttons, and dials can be worked from outside the housing. The glory of that technology is that we can shoot hundreds of images on a single dive as long as there's space on the memory card and the battery holds out. There's no changing cards or batteries underwater, though. We also can get immediate feedback from viewing the images on the camera back instead of waiting for slide film to be developed. Uh, we usually shoot with autofocus, auto white balance, and everything else we, we shoot manual. We set for a single shot mode because the strobes don't cycle fast enough for continuous shooting. Now, on night dives, we also mount a flashlight on the housing that helps us assist with the autofocus um, uh, mode. Uh, and yes, night dives, the darker, the better, because we have a whole different cast of creatures uh, that come out at night compared to what we see during the daylight hours. Here's just one example. An unknown tiny fish in the black water at night attracted to our lights. Our next trip goal is for black water diving at night in the open ocean to see what comes <coughs> up in the reef. All kinds of weird tiny creatures are showing up in the photos we've seen. And that trip was postponed due to the global sequestering. Even with the best skills and equipment, underwater nature photographers encounter significant challenges and frustrations. Let's take these points one at a time. First and foremost, it's essential to be a safe diver. The more skilled you are in controlling your buoyancy, fins, and hands, the better your photos will be. We dive within safe sports diving limits, which is 100 feet or less. 
Dieting practicalities limit where you go, how long you can stay, and how you come back up safely, regardless of what shots you might have to miss. Controlling your buoyancy and fins also helps protect the fragile reef ecosystem from damage. About water and cameras. Remember the line from Jurassic Park where Jeff Goldblum says, life finds a way? It's equally true that water finds a way. Even a single piece of lint or hair on an O-ring seal can result in a leak. Camera electronics don't do well with wet, especially salt water. And we already mentioned not being able to change memory uh, cards, batteries, or lenses underwater. This is an example of what happens when you run into a wide angle subject when you're set up with your 105 macro lens. You get a sea turtle face rather than a sea turtle body. Some underwater systems do allow non-electronic lenses to be changed on the outside. All right. Part of the reason uh, that we use autofocus is that distances underwater are very deceiving. Unlike the uh, side view mirrors on your car where objects are closer than they appear, underwater objects appear about 25% closer than they actually are. This makes manual focusing challenging unless you are shooting very wide angle with great depth of field. Compounding the degree of difficulty with underwater photography, especially macro photography, is that everything is moving in three-dimensional space. A creature, photographer, other critters, and even the water itself are all moving, especially when there's a bit of current or changing tides. This makes both composition and focusing very challenging. And then there's the issue of white balance and how light behaves at depth. Natural light from the sun begins to diminish within feet of the surface. This means that at any significant depth, there's not enough natural light for photography. This is not just about the amount of light, but it also affects colors. Water filter filters out colors uh, based on the wavelengths of the light involved. You can see from the graph that reds begin disappearing before you descend it even to 20 feet depth. And yellows are pretty faded by 50 feet. Greens are gone about 70. And blues are very muted at 100 foot depth. They're still light, but it's very blue color. Things are pretty monochromatic to the eye at these depths. The solution to loss of both light and color is to use the powerful strobes that we do uh, to fill uh, the photographs at shallower depths and to supplement or replace light lost deeper down. Um, and in night photography, you need the strobes at any depth. Uh, one problem with lights at night is that they tend to attract plankton and worms and all kinds of other small squiggly stuff that ruin pictures when they get between your lens and the subject. And then they also get stuck in your hair and in your ears. And <laughs> that's the worst. So. Hey guys. Can yeah. I interrupt you one sec? Um, uh, someone had the question of, do you guys shoot raw? Yes, always, yeah. always. We shoot raw and then when we process, we save our images as TIFF files. But yeah, all right. Did that answer the question? Okay. I we do yes, it did. yes, it did, thank you. Okay, we do a lot of night diving with red filters on our dive lights. And that tends to minimize and fool these critters. They don't see the red light. And the strobes are only momentary flashes, so it doesn't attract as many critters. Red filters also keep us from ruining your night vision or your dive buddy's night vision when they look to see where you are or when you flash your strobes in their eyes. <laughs> so the solution to several of these challenges is to minimize the distance. In other words, the amount of water between the lens and the subject. The less water between them, the better the image. This is a photo Frank took of me taking a picture of a gray reef shark. 
The first rule we have for underwater photography is get close, then get closer. We're often asked if we worry about big fish with teeth, barracuda and sharks, for example. The answer is really no, not really. We understand their behavior and our number one rule in diving is don't look like food. We're a lot more concerned with things that sting, things like this fire coral. Brushing against it triggers all those little stinging hairs to release into your skin. The pain stops you in your tracks and momentarily blinds you with tears while you wait for the initial pain to subside. Then you have to endure a nasty itchy rash for weeks afterward. Avoiding things like this is another reason why having good diving skills and control is so important before adding the distraction of photography. Also lots of steroid cream. <laughs> yeah. Another significant- I'm just yes. curious, on the, I had a question. I mean, you guys have wetsuits on and things like that. So when you run across something like that, does it literally sting through your wetsuit? Or are you looking at like your hands where you have exposed skin? Right. Both. Um, the, the, mostly we dive with lycra skins and not with full wetsuits because we're in warm water. And so some of this stuff gets through. Uh, but a lot of times it'll be, you know, you'll, you, know, you knock it with a hand or, or, you know, your dive buddy kicks up a little bit of it and it stings you on the neck or something. So, yeah, there's some bare skin. Okay. No, me. Um, so another significant challenge in underwater photography that we don't usually face on land is that water is not clear like the air. Unfortunately, what makes the water not clear often ruins good shots. Your strobes pick up and highlight all the silt, sand, and tiny plankton between the lens and the subject, like this silty shot of an upside down jellyfish. Here's the same image after 90 minutes of clone stamp cleaning in Photoshop. You might wonder why the jellyfish is upside down. It lives like this on the sandy bottom in relatively shallow water. This is because it lives with symbiotic algae within its tissues and it needs to expose that algae to sunlight so it can photosynthesize and pro produce energy for the jellyfish over and above what the jellyfish gets from consuming plankton. Photographing critters can also be challenging based on their nature, too. A surprising number of them are relatively see-through, probably as an adaptation to not becoming prey. Being see-through makes it challenging for autofocus to work, and often the strobes need to be re-aimed to the side so the light doesn't just pass through them and into the distance. Jellyfish present these kinds of challenges. It's very hard to get cameras to focus on something that is basically clear when you are moving up and down all around and when you're photographing at night. This shrimp is almost see-through too as it sits near the mouth of an anemone. The added trick with this shot was composing it without the anemone's tentacles being in the way. This is one of those shots I wish I had taken. It's one of Audrey's best shots. And she just, she nailed it. I mean, it's just a perfect underwater photo. This, I wish I'd had this when we did the Georgia O'Keeffe contest. <laughs> this shrimp is another example of mostly see-through critters. If you look very carefully, at the underbelly, underside of her belly, there's a clutch of green eggs waiting to hatch. See right here where the arrow is pointing. And just to be transparent, pun intended, no one knew about the eggs until we looked at the photo on the computer screen. That happens a lot. Mm -hmm. Simply finding interesting subjects can be difficult unless you know what to look for and where to look. The better critters are at hiding, the better they are at surviving. Camouflage is a common strategy of in our interesting subjects have adopted to avoid being eaten. 
We've often taken pictures of junk and flotsam, thinking it might be a cool critter, only to quietly delete them before anyone sees our mistakes. Here's an example of why it's worth taking a shot anyway. This image is of a robust ghost pipefish hanging just above the sand, looking for all the world like a broken off piece of seagrass. Maybe this will help you see it better. See it now? These two stonefish represent more examples of camouflage. Stonefish venom is potentially lethal to humans. It's one of the most venomous creatures on the planet. The toxin resides in the stonefish's fin spines and it's used for defense. A stonefish uses camouflage to fool its prey into a false sense of security, snapping up little fish that swim too near. Incidentally, the parts that look like dirt or algae on the yellow one, that's the fish's coloration. It's grown to add to the cam camouflage effect. That's actually part of the fish's skin. The scorpion fish is also a type of stonefish. It grows skin pieces that look very much like the algae and reef it's hiding on. Scorpion fish sit in areas of rock where they blend in really well. This is just another reason why divers shouldn't be touching the reef. Other stealth predators that rely on camouflage are frogfish. This one looks just like an orange sponge attached to the reef. But if small fish swim too close, the frogfish devours the unsuspecting prey. Maybe this will help you see it better. See it now? This little cryptic teardrop crab has adopted a different camouflage strategy. It decorates itself with pieces of sponge and bits of stinging hydroids on its body. If you look closely at this profile, you can see its eye to the right, just below the second lump of sponge. And this little cowrie mollusk blends in well with its soft coral location. Mm -hmm. All right, one of our prized finds on any trip to the Indo-West Pacific is this tiny little creature. It's called a Bargabanti pygmy seahorse. No one seems to have known it even existed until it was accidentally discovered on Seafan in 1969 by a guy named Bargabanti. The species only gets to about maybe two and a half centimeters or about an inch in size. And that includes a fairly long tail that's coiled around the coral, counting for about half of their body length. It is very small and very well camouflaged, very hard creature to find. One challenge with photographing any type of seahorse is that they always seem to turn away from the camera, always. It's the rule, the, the rule rather than the exception. Once people knew these little critters existed, more types were discovered, mostly during the early 2000s. This is a color variant of a Denise type of pygmy seahorse, about two centimeters of three quarters of an inch long, including the curled up tail. It's got great camouflage, basically takes on the color of the coral that it's on. If you're lucky, you can get a face on shot. You know, that's the prize. And this is another Denise type of pygmy seahorse that fortunately was facing into the, the camera lens. In short, degree of difficulty with these critters is a full 10 out of 10. Hard to find, hard to get faces, hard to keep soft coral out of the way, hard to light, hard to focus, hard to leave. 
That's for you sailors. Pipe horses are related to seahorses. This one's about, oh, two inches long. Camouflage look like a piece of algae covered flotsam. However, um, as it moved, uh, I'm sorry, it, it's meant to look like a piece of flotsam as it moves around the reef. Here again, it's trying to look like an extension of that piece of coral that it's cling, clung onto. Uh, the sea the pipe horse, in evolutionary terms, is a link between seahorses and pipe fish. This is one of our all time favorite subjects. They are not very common, usually well hidden in the reef. It is an ornate ghost pipefish, much more decorative than the robust ghost pipefish we showed you earlier, the one that looked like a piece of broken off seagrass. This is another one hanging out near the crinoid it was holding, it was hiding in. We'll try something a little tougher now. First, the obvious creature in this picture is the orange crinoid. It looks like a bushy orange plant, but it's an animal. It can let go of the reef with its feet and use its many feathered arms to swim freely. They come in a wide range of colors and color patterns and are closely related to starfish. This is a squat lobster down at the base of the crinoid, well camouflaged. It's about an inch in size. So inside one creature, we find another creature. Here we have a color variant of the squat lobster in among the crinoid's feathered arms. They usually take on the color of the, the host that they're living on. This little black squat lobster shows up in the photo taken with flash, but remember the red color in the crinoid would not be visible at depth, to our, at least to our eye. So when we looked at it, it, it looked like the crinoid was black too. This guy really blended in. He only shows up when you flash the light on it. Tiny shrimp also live camouflaged in crinoids. This blue one even has spots that mimic the tips of the crinoid's arm feathers. It was less than a half inch long. This might help you see it. There it is. To emphasize the degree of difficulty in capturing crinoid shrimp images, the crinoid is rapidly waving and curling up its arms when it senses your presence, taking the shrimp with it or getting in between the lens and the shrimp, ruining the shot. It takes a great deal of stealth and patience once you've even spotted one to capture it in focus. One more type of crinoid shrimp. Having trouble picking it out? Here we go. Still see it? Tiny fish sometimes are found nested in the, among the crinoid arms too. This is the first one we ever found. And this is only the second one. One of the really hardest to photograph is this very tiny green shrimp that lives on blades of seagrass, looking for all the world like a bit of the grass itself that bump along the bottom side of the grass blade. Its eye is the little white dot. It has its front legs lined up in front of its head and the tail up near the top. All right, here we have an, another example of predatory camouflage behavior. This fish is called a stargazer. Uh, I guess that's because it's looking up. Um, it's not very commonly seen at all, especially fully out in the open like this. 
more often, you're likely to see uh, just the face of the fish. And this is the last thing a small fish might see of a stargazer hiding buried in the sand where it lunges out to catch its prey. It also emits an electrical charge similar to electric eels. Camouflage brings us to the topic of animal behavior. We've shown you a bit about how it's used both to hunt prey and to avoid predators. Any nature photography effort is improved by understanding animal behavior, and this is true for underwater critter photography as well. Here are some other animal behaviors demonstrated in our images. This, you might think, is about a predator and prey, that the fish is about to eat the shrimp. Actually, shrimp is cleaning the fish, doing a dental and dermatology job. The shrimp gets to eat what it finds, and the fish gains protection from diseases and parasites. At other times, the fish might be a predator, but the fish communicates their willingness to forego a snack by the position they adopt and the shrimp advertise that they're open for cleaning business by doing a little dance that involves waggling and a lot of antenna waving. When the fish assumes this position, the shrimp and cleaner fish jump on. So here you have a small blue striped neon goby cleaning the face of a grouper and a shrimp cleaning the chin. The cleaners will go actually inside the mouth and the gills of the critter to eat the parasites. All kinds of nooks and crannies throughout the reef serve as shelter. We often see an eel sticking its head out of the crack or crevice, not usually two. But if you want to anthropomorphize a bit, the looks on their faces make one doubt this is a case of domestic bliss. And this zebra eel pair does not appear to be much happier. We're not sure how that larger one got its wound um, kind of on the body of the fish. Just as crinoids played host to the squat lobster, crinoid shrimp, and crinoid fish, there are other instances of small critters living on others. We spend a lot of time looking closely at starfish, sea cucumbers, and sea urchins to see what might be happening in the marine version of Whoville. This is an example of a starfish we would be checking out for little critters. Okay, this is a tiny emperor shrimp living on a starfish. And to give you some perspective, the shrimp is about a half a centimeter or about a quarter of an inch in size. And the bumps are a close-up of the starfish's surface. Another emperor shrimp on a starfish. And these critters are very cagey. They run to the underside of the creature they live on when they see you coming. So it's a race to get the shot before it spoots away. Really challenging and frustrating. Again, another 10 out of 10 on the challenge scale, but rewarding when you get it right. And you may notice most of these critters take on the color, again, uh, for camouflage purposes, they take on the color of the critter they're on. This emperor shrimp is living on a sea cucumber. This is another one of Audrey's pictures and another photo that I wish I, I had taken because it's really good. This is a pair of Coleman shrimp, and they are living on a fire urchin. And the urchin has a lot of stingers, so you don't want to touch it. Okay, it may help you to see them. This is actually a pair. I think the smaller one is the male, the larger one is the female. And this may help you see them both. See them? And sometimes we find these little pea crabs living amongst the sea urchin spines. And the, 
those yellow spines are that of a heart urchin. And these crabs actually take shelter um, in amongst the, uh, the critter's spines. And this urchin usually only comes up from under the sand in the night. So during the day it's buried and at night they pop up from under the sand. This butterfly fish's bit of camouflage trickery involves predators thinking that the large black spot on the is the fish's eye. And when it goes to catch the fish from what it thinks is the head, the fish has a chance to swim away in the other direction. Better to get nipped in the butt than bitten in the head. Some critters go to the opposite extreme and have quite flamboyant displays rather than trying to blend in. This is an angle, an, uh, a type of angelfish um, in its juvenile form. And there's no way the harlequin shrimp is going for camouflage. Corals are teeming with small critters seeking shelter. This is bubble coral with a little goby hiding out. This orangutan crab buries itself in the bubble coral too, coming out to catch food in the passing current. This is a little secretary blenny hiding in a hole within hard coral. The green in the coral shows its healthy symbiotic algae. The algae dies if something blocks the sunlight, like sand or silt being kicked onto the surface of the coral by diver fins, or when a hurricane dumps sand over coral. When the algae dies, the coral dies too. This coral bleaching is the result of other environmental threats, like overheating and viral infection. Polluting chemicals from sunscreen residue in the water can cause coral polyp animals to die off as well. And you may be seeing reef safe printed on your sunscreen labels now. Juvenile fish use the coral reefs, nooks and crannies for shelter too. This is a type of juvenile cowfish hiding in the coral reef. And a little trunk fish. Okay, uh, I assume you can see that file fish, which is hiding out in the soft coral, blending in pretty well. This is a long-nosed hawkfish taking shelter in a different type of soft coral. Now, these critters are particularly difficult because they generally occur at depths that are kind of at the limit of how deep we're able to go uh, when we dive. Seahorses are also dependent on the shelter that the reef provides. They kind of attach on um, for protection and for stability. Uh, there are two little green fish that have taken shelter inside the dome of this moon jellyfish. And again, this is one of those instances where I don't think we knew they were there until we saw the the critter on the computer screen. Anemones house another array of critters as well. These are porcelain crabs that hang out on a type of flat carpet anemone. This porcelain crab, crab hangs out on a different type of anemone, but uh, you know, still is using the anemone for protection. A wide variety of shrimp also make their homes in and around these anemones. This is a, a good example of one. Um, you see the beautiful colors, but this is a shrimp that's probably about a half an inch to a, an inch in size. 
Sponges are good hiding places as well. And this is an orange shrimp that's looking out from its perch inside of an iridescent purple vase sponge. This little guy has a hairy crab and is using the sponge as its home base. Another place we often search is along whip or wire corals that project out into the current off the reef wall. Shrimp move up and down the length of these corals, snatching up bits that float by in the current. This is a tiny wire coral shrimp about a half inch long. The degree of difficulty in shooting these critters goes way beyond finding them. They're cagey, and when you approach, they scoot around the other side of the wire coral. The trick is to get them to come back to the side where you are with the camera. All this while the wire coral is bobbing around in the current, and so are you and your camera. More often than not, we give up in frustration or have a fight. There's a whole, you know, there's sign language for underwater for diving. And we've taken that to a whole new level when we fight underwater. So, <laughs> but we're not showing any images of that. <laughs> this is one more type of car, uh, wire coral shrimp. Wire coral gobies, different than the shrimp because there it's a fish, are just as cagey as those shrimp were. And another wire coral goby. Usually we find only one goby on a strand. Actually, we usually find none. This time we found a pair. We're not sure if this is the life cycle thing happening or just a coincidence. Which brings us to the next category of interesting animal behavior mating. This is a pair of indigo hamlets doing their life cycle thing. And here's a colorful creature called a mantis shrimp protecting a huge ball of its fertilized eggs. The yellow-headed jawfish male carries the fertilized eggs in its mouth without eating at all for about 10 days until the eggs hatch, while the female is scouting around for another mate. This is because the um, high predation rate that they need to have a high reproduction rate. The males are very shy when they have the eggs, but they have to come out of their hole periodically to rotate and aerate the eggs. They actually spit them out of their mouths and spin the eggs around and then suck them back in. All right, back to our topic of animal behavior. We've shown a number of examples of the first four on the list. Now we turn to communication and schooling behaviors. This demonstrates schooling behavior and it's been the subject of study by system scientists. This behavior is actually quite complex, involving a significant amount of, com of communication. The behavior is less random than it appears when watching it unfold live. This is a school of French grunts. It's unusual to be able to photograph schools from the front. Usually you get either a side view or a southern view of a northbound school, aka the butt shot. Here is a school of golden sweepers, and each one again is about the size of a minnow, maybe about two inches long. And this is a school of these venomous small catfish. They are known to have venomous stinging barbs and keep your hands away. Yeah, keep your hands away. And they occur in these little balls or bunches. Butterfly fish are usually found in pairs, but this particular kind tend to group in small schools. Photography uh, of schools of fish successfully has a lot to do with depth of field. 
because getting enough of them in the same plane at the same time, it's also hard not to cut off body parts of those in the front or around the edges of your photograph. Squid, octopus, and cuttlefish all communicate with changes in their color patterns. And this is a relatively calm and relaxed octopus, I think for small fish and shellfish and the nooks and crannies of the reef at night. You can tell its state by its being kind of an overall ghostly bluish color. And these are night creatures, so you don't see these during the day. See, this one again is fairly relaxed. And from this angle, you can actually look into the gills. Uh, there's a siphon um, organ just below the eye on the head of the creature. And the octopus sucks water in and then blows it out through the siphon. And that's how it extracts oxygen from the water. Now, this is a different octopus, and this one is not so happy. It was really getting annoyed by the lights and the attention, and so it turned a bright red. And they can also pulse colors quickly uh, as a warning or to startle predators. This is a cuttlefish, again, another type of the, that uh, kind of creature. And again, it's got its usual calm colors. However, this one's communicating that it's interested in mating through its colors and its pose. Squid also use color changes in position for their communication. Sometimes at night, they come in to check out the flashing of our strobes and our dive lights. It's always a thrill when they show up. We love squiddies. They're one of our favorite creatures. And they often occur in pairs or in small groups. And we don't know what they're trying to communicate. But the position is this position is usually followed by a mad dash for the squid taking off. Here, territorial message is being delivered by the small sailfin blenny. It pops out of its hole from time to time, flares open its dorsal fin, shaking it rapidly for effect, and then it pops back in the hole. It all happens really rapidly. Remember, we can't shoot on continuous fire because of our strobe cycling time. So <laughs> this is a very lucky shot. Right timing. The final animal behavior we want to focus on is symbiosis. When two or more species work cooperatively and all benefit from the relationship. The relationship between the clownfish and its host anemone is a classic example. The anemone gets fierce protection from anything that might come by to nibble on it. And the fish gets protection, particularly for their young, from predators because of the anemone's stinging tentacles. The fish, these fish have evolved immunity to the anemone sting. A cautious young one. This one is guarding a carpet of several anemones all at once. Sometimes strong current forces an anemone to curl up, showing its underside, and the clownfish crowd inside. This is from the underside of another anemone. This electric clam is an example of what you might think of as a mollusk a soft-bodied creature inside a shell. It looks a lot like a scallop. You may or may not know that the squid, octopus, and cuttlefish we showed you earlier are also types of mollusks. Another of our favorite subjects is also a mollusk, the large and diverse group called nudibranchs, nudies for short. 
The name nudibranch means naked gills. In this case, the cluster on the left are gills on this creature that somewhat resembles a slug or a snail without a shell. Its sensory organs are the two stalks on the right. The next few slides show just a bit of the diversity in nudibranchs around the world. Maybe you'll see why we love shooting them so much. I think that's a gold crowned sea goddess. And just a really pretty one. These tend to be very well camouflaged too. They're small and hard to see. So you need to really have a keen eye. Because remember the light brings out the color, but most of the time these are very drab when you look at them. We used to think they were vegetarians eating just the algae until one day we caught one of those striped ones from before eating one of these solid blue ones. They move surprisingly fast. There are thousands or hundreds of thousands of different varieties of these critters. Um, in this type, the gills are all over instead of in a gill cluster like those earlier ones we showed you. Um, these gill, uh, the little, they have little stinging cells on the tips of their gills. You can see why these beauties are our favorite subjects. This is the last nudibranch we'll show you. It's quite a bit larger than the others. As you can see, it's got two of those emperor shrimp living on it. Not to be confused with the nudibranchs, there's some beautiful flatworms out there too. Okay, now we get to what our youngest daughter calls the big stuff. Since we spend most of our time showing you the tiny macro world, we wanted to close out with some big stuff. So just so you know, we do that too. We sometimes put wide angle lenses on our cameras and shoot bigger critters. This is a wild manatee in Florida's Homosassa River. It's cold water and you can only snorkel with these creatures, but this is during manatee season when they come in from the ocean into the fresh water. Yeah. No scuba gear allowed. Here we have a young humpback whale diving after taking a breath on the surface. Also has to be done on snorkel only, no scuba gear allowed. Because the scuba gear, the scuba diving bubbles and sounds actually chase the creatures away. They don't like that. It stresses concern. them. Okay, this is a picture I took on a very recent trip to the Cocos, uh, to Cocos Island uh, off the coast of um, Costa Rica, and it was just before the pandemic kind of hit. Uh, this is a dolphin re-entering the water after catching some air on the surface. The pod was feeding on a big school of fish, of right. bait fish. And this is another one. We usually hear the dolphins before you see them. They make a series of clicks and whistles uh, that are very, very characteristic. And if you know what to listen for, um, you know, there's no question that they're nearby. Then, of course, you know, the fish that everyone is waiting for and interested in, sharks. This is a gray tip reef shark or a gray reef shark, which is probably the most common uh, type of shark in the Caribbean. Um, Go back for a second. Underneath the body of the shark is a fish called a remora. And it literally has a suction device kind of on the back of its head and it sticks and gloms onto the belly of the shark and basically hitches a ride and is able to get food that the shark will sometimes eat, pieces that float in the, in the water. This is another shark shot and it's actually a classic view that everyone strives to get, where you're taking a picture up, um, looking from down under the shark, so you get the nice white belly and the gray 
back of the shark with the eye and the mouth nicely in focus. Again, another example. This is a black tip reef shark, again, from Cocos Island in the Eastern Pacific. And you can see the remora uh, hitching the ride on its underside. And so the fish can attach and detach without harming its host. These two guys are interesting. This is a pair of white tip uh, reef sharks. They're the only type of shark that can actively breathe while holding still. Most sharks have to swim in order to move water uh, through their gills to get oxygen. These type of sharks will lie on the bottom and uh, they're able to get sufficient oxygen. They don't have to swim. This is a couple of hammerheads. There's one in the distance and one a little closer up. They are very skittish and very hard to get close to. They usually are headed away from you when you see them. This is one of the most awe-inspiring uh, fish. It's called a whale shark. It's the largest fish in the world, growing to a bit more than 30 feet long. Unfortunately, they are not, um, they don't have teeth. And so they eat mostly small fish and krill that they filter from the water. And as is often the case, this uh, whale shark has a lot of kind of schooling hangers on. They tend to follow the, the shark uh, probably for protection more than anything else. Again, another example, and you can see the remora mm. uh, up on, on the its head. Nose. Yeah, on its head. So, well, all things must come to an end, and this is the end of our talk. Thanks for your interest, and I think, you know, the fact that you sat through our 125 plus uh, slides uh, is admirable. So I think we'll entertain questions at this point. That was great, Frank. Thanks. It was wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. It's the high point of my day, maybe my yeah. week. You need to raise the bar. <laughs> Gorgeous photos. Thank you. Very nice. I thought it was looking at initial geographic stuff. Fantastic images. Really wonderful. Absolutely. Question. What lenses do you use? You can let me dance. Yeah. Uh, my favorite lens is the 105 micro because uh, we shoot Nikonos or Nikons. Um, that, that's my favorite. We also have a 60 micro, which we tend not to use as often. Um, and then what, what do we use? We, wide for angle? wide angle, there is a uh, 17 to 35 zoom. And we generally you want to take it in the, in the 20 uh, or, uh, you know, wider range. Um, the problem there is, is that you've got to get really close when you're shooting at about 20 millimeters. Um, if you're more than two, three feet away from the creature, uh, especially sharks, um, it's just too small and you don't get a very good image. No. What kind of fish is that? <laughs> Where were some of the places that you were filming? We we pretty slide. Slide. Yeah, we took out that slide. We took out that slide. We we these are vacations, so we just stick to warm water where it's nice and relaxed and and easy. Um, so we a lot of what you saw is in the Caribbean, um, uh, Cayman, uh, Belize, uh, Honduras, um, Cayman Islands. Cayman Islands. Uh, we've done a little bit of work in the. Um, Red Sea, and I say work because there was a lot of current there. Um, our favorite area is really in a lot of the areas in Indonesia, um, uh, closer uh, on the east side, closer to Papua New Guinea. Um, and Australia. We've never been to the Great Barrier Reef, that's something everyone asks, but there's actually more diversity um, in the uh, Indonesia um, areas. And uh, there are a couple of places we were supposed to go to the Philippines. That trip also got canceled um, for a macro photography workshop because um, there are just all kinds of cool it's, little critters. It, yeah, the, the biodiversity in, in that area is fantastic, partly because it's actually in a lot of those areas, you get um, two or three seas that are coming together. Currents. 
yeah. actual seas, different, yeah. you know, they're, they're different named seas when you look at the map um, coming together. And that's where you get some incredible biodiversity. Yeah. So the other, been, thing, the other thing about the places we go is they're not very well trafficked. And that's important. The problem with the Great Barrier Reef is, you know, it, it's, it's like the O'Hare Airport yeah. of the dive world. And there tends to be a lot of reef damage when there's a lot of divers. Um, and so we tend to go to the places where more experienced divers and fewer divers. So the reef gets a chance healthier, healthier and, and get a chance to recover. Yeah. Have you seen much evidence of the uh, pollution and damage to the reefs? Different times we have. Um, there was a spell, particularly long spell in um, off the coast of Honduras when the islands were being sold a lot of uh, nitrogen concentrated fertilizer for their gardens and their fields and it was all washing into the ocean which was causing a lot of algae that was smothering the reef. Um, as soon as they banned that nitrogen out of there the reef rebounded and, and that looked really good. The, the biggest problem we're having um, with the Caribbean these days lionfish. is the lionfish have eaten everything. Um, it's a it's a very very successful predator. Um, eats all the babies and the juveniles. It's it's an invader. It's a Pacific fish, and it has predators in the Pacific. But the theory is is that during one of the hurricanes, there were a number of these fish that escaped from an aquarium, uh, I think in the Bahamas, and they have literally multiplied to the point where they are absolutely decimating uh, the reefs there. So eventually they will get a predator. Um, a lot of the divers are trying to train sharks and um, some, of the, some of the bigger groupers and, and fish to eat them. Um, unfortunately, what they've learned to do is follow the divers around to get fed them. They haven't learned to hunt them. <laughs> the diver will spear the fish. You're allowed to spear lionfish. It's the only fish and the places we go that you can actively hunt because these are protected nature areas, but you're allowed to spear them. The other thing they have done is they've tried to serve them uh, in restaurants to make them a commercial fish. A delicacy. Yeah, it, it hasn't worked out too well. So, <laughs> This may be a dumb question, but can they not import the predator from the Pacific into the Atlantic? For the well, then, you're introducing, <laughs> then you're introducing another whole problem right. um, because now that predator is possibly going to eat a lot of other things too. So oh, every yeah, time good point. there's a, a huge history of invasive species that they've brought other species in and it hasn't worked. And sometimes it's because the creature that they want to eliminate is a nocturnal creature and the species that they bring in is a diurnal creature that comes out during the day. And so it, there's many examples, if you want to go and look them up, of ill-fated attempts uh, to do that. Usually it doesn't work out. So I, I have a question. How do you, uh, do you know the names of the things you're photographing when you take the pictures or uh, do you look them up and how do you actually find, find out what it is that you took a picture of? Well, after 35 years of doing this, we've gotten pretty good at knowing the names. I don't know that we know the scientific names of all of these critters, but we certainly know their, their common names. And, and I like to name the fish, you know, Joe, Mary. <laughs> you know, that, that. A lot of times there's something specific that we're going after. And so, so we, know, we know what it is we're trying to actually find. And then we've also got a lot of fish guide books that, and the internet that have different, you can, you can identify fish by their shape or by their location or whatever. Um, so we usually just try to run it down after the, after the fact. The other thing is, is that, and I, this thought popped into my head, one, we're on our dive trips. Um, there are dive guides who are native to the areas, have been diving on the reefs for their, you know, all their lives, and are very good at knowing where critters hang out and, and their behavior. And so if you ask them, look, we want to go take a picture of a, you know, pygmy seahorse, 
they will take you down and they will find these critters for you um, that are sometimes, you know, you, you have no way of knowing um, where they are. And I'm always amazed at how good they are at finding things for us. There, there's, uh, there's an application called iNaturalist, which my uh, grandsons use, which is amazing. You can take a picture of animals or uh, growing things, and uh, usually it'll identify them right away. If not, uh, people will identify and come back to, to you. So uh, that's something that works wonderful. We had a bad experience way back when. We found a creature that we, d we didn't show it. We called it an LGD, little green dude. And it's a very small shrimp, plume shrimp that only occur, only hung out on these purple corals. And there's a guy called Paul Human, Human, and he was one of the experts in the world on, on identification. We sent him a photograph of the, the LGD, and he never answered us back. And ultimately, you know, they were pictures of them, not our picture, uh, in his guidebook. But Oops. Yeah, well, you know, no, I'm not sure that we were the first to find the critter. It's not like we would have been naming it the Frank, yeah, the Frank shrimp. Have you, ever dived, have you ever dived on wrecks and in freshwater? I have. We don't really like diving in freshwater when it's cold. You have to wear a lot of gear. Um, you don't have the same buoyancy. It, it, diving in, in Lake Michigan when we lived in Wisconsin, it was not pleasant. There's something called a thermocline. And in the ocean, because the currents are moving the water around, the water temperature tends to be pretty constant. And it's the same on the surface as it is at depth. In cold water, as you go deeper, the water gets colder. And, you know, there's nothing like diving in 50 degree water um, where you have to wear a full quarter inch uh, wetsuit um, or thicker. And uh, I went ice diving once, and that was a one time in a lifetime experience. <laughs> the other <laughs> disappointment about, about um, at least the Great Lakes wrecks is that the reason those wrecks are there is because the, the Great Lakes are really, really rough. And that means that the Great Lakes have also torn up the wrecks. And so by the time one of the wrecks we went to, it looked like somebody had just thrown a bunch of two by fours on the, on the sandy bottom. And there were, you know, no corals, nothing interesting about it. So it's, it's not worth the effort to me. Dick, I've been to a place called Truck Lagoon. And oh, yeah. it was a whole Japanese fleet of tenders and supply ships that were sunk in this lagoon. And you can dive on the wrecks. And the really neat thing is, is that the wrecks are there. And then there's all kinds of stuff growing on the outside of the wrecks. The problem with that is you got to be very careful. Wreck diving is one of the more dangerous, dangerous. types of diving. You don't want to penetrate a wreck in places where you can't easily get out because there's a lot of silt and your fins kick up the silt and you can't see two inches in front of your face and people get disoriented and they die. So you got to be careful. The wrecks that are, are <clears throat> made safe and they seal off any areas and they weld shut places that you're not supposed to go. But that and cave diving are probably two of the, the most associated with the greatest number of fatalities in terms of- Do you do any cave diving? No. <laughs> you, don't, you don't dive. I mean, you really need special equipment for cave diving. You need lines and all kinds of things. Yes, you also really trust the other people. Uh, we've been in a couple of caves, small caves, um, where somebody else kicked the silt up and, and couldn't find the exit. So oh, God. I don't trust oh. the other people. <laughs> yeah, we don't, we don't dive anywhere where there isn't air above, above us. us. And how, how long do you stay down in the different temperatures? How long are your dives? A typical dive for us is about an hour. Um, the deeper you go, the less time you can spend because of the nitrogen and you have to worry about, you know, your, your nitrogen load. And, um, and you also, the percentage of each breath takes more air out of your tank. 
for us, the most of the things we really like to see are living somewhere between 30 and 60 feet. So we can pretty much die for about an hour um, on a tank of air. Thank you. I have one quick question. Um, you, guys have been, you guys have been um, uh, diving for so long. Have you seen the different places you're going? Any types of environmental differences or changes over that period of time? Since yeah, it's been well over 30 years. Yeah. And I was just curious if you've noticed or seen anything. Well, one example is like Cayman Island. Uh, Cayman Islands got hit with a hurricane and there's a, a stretch uh, of the main island called Seven Mile Beach. And there were, used to be dive sites all on the Seven Mile Beach, it was famous. Well, the hurricane kicked up all the sand and the silt, which settled on the reef. And I mean, the reefs were absolutely, you know, dead zones. Um, the other thing that we noticed, and we didn't show an example, is bleaching. And Audrey talked about the symbiotic algae that lives in the corals that gives it the, the colors that they, they have. Well, bleaching, when there's chemicals and things in the water, or when the water temperature heats, and if you're someone who believes in climate change, that's real, the algae dies. The coral can still be alive for a while. But if the algae doesn't come back, which sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, the coral gets this white color because the the algae is what gives it the, the, the color. And, um, you know, the, we've seen more of that. Where were we recently? We're it's kind of all over the place. What, one of the nice sides of this, though, is we've seen places where um, communities have gotten together and created artificial reefs that the coral has started to take over. And so um, they might for example, they've sunk some small airplanes or they've sunk some different ships. ships. Things that are vertical tend to, um, the, the coral tends to uh, eventually take on to it. And so we're actually seeing reef getting built in, in some communities. It's, it's kind of exciting. There's also projects where they're growing. They're actually trying to farm coral and grow the coral that they can transplant, then transplant yeah. uh, onto the reefs. But these types of projects, I mean, coral grows about a centimeter um, every 10 years or inch every 10 years. And so, yeah. It takes it, a long time to build a, a reef. It takes a long time. We're not gonna uh, see it. <laughs> Maybe our great grandchildren might, but yeah. Fascinating. Okay, so, uh, I'm a scuba diver and I've taken underwater photography and one of the things that was um, a little, I don't know, uh, do you, when you're doing macro photography, do you float in the water column or do you put a finger on like a dead part of the reef so that you can anchor yourself if, if the, the, um, Search. Yeah. It, it really it really depends. Um, we try to the best of our ability to float. Um, in you know that works really well if you're, there's no tide changing or there's not a current. Um, if there's something like on the reef where we're trying to get in really close, then you know I'll often put a, a, a finger out and like you said, find a piece of dead something and and still myself on that. Usually that's about all it takes to steady me. Right. and then I'm able to shoot with the other hand. One reason that we don't do that is these cameras, um, they're heavy. And even though they're kind of a, pretty buoyant, they still have a lot of mass that you have to move through the water because they're big. And there are two handles on either side of the housing. M much of the time you need to be holding uh, with your left hand because the trigger for the the shutter release is on the right. And if you're trying to um, use the trigger device on the right, the camera tends to be weighted down. So you need to hold it on the left. So the best way is to really be well buoyant. Um, there are some times where if there's a sandy bottom, you, we can settle down on the sandy bottom and take a picture of a critter 
um, those jawfish with the eggs almost always occur in the sand. And you literally have to wait sometimes 20 minutes or a half an hour for the critter to come back out of the hole and aerate the eggs. And so we will oftentimes settle down and then sit there and wait a whole dive just to get the pictures that we want. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. The other time when we would do things is I, we've used reef hooks in places where there's really a lot of current and you want to see sharks or big things that like to be in the current, um, you will sometimes use a reef hook and you hook it into a dead area of coral and then it's strapped so that it holds you in one place so that your hands are free and you can take pictures and do what you want and not get blown away by the current off the reef into the, the free water. <laughs> into the blue. <laughs> into the blue. Oh, yeah. And so, so you, you haven't have... seen a lot of coral bleaching? Uh, um, sometimes in some places and then, um, you know, times other not. times not. Yeah. Well, that's and encouraging. Again, a lot of that has to do with where we chose, where we choose to go. So we're going yeah. to some really remote places where the, the like the sunscreen and the um, divers and, and divers kicking sand and, and whatever yeah. aren't a problem. So a lot of it has to do with, we go to some very remote places where there's been a lot less damage done to the reef. But however, the, the temperature of the water is a biggie. Yeah. And it's, the it's definitely getting yeah. warmer. Yeah, it's getting warmer. I think they estimate that it's like a degree warmer than it used to be. And that's enough. These ecosystems are so fragile that you know that's often enough to uh, kill the algae and cause the bleaching. And so I think globally, um, it's it's more common than it used to be. There are some things that some creatures that we used to see all the time that we either haven't seen in years or we see maybe once in a week instead of every dive. Um, a lot of those Caribbean anemones we used to see at least all the, all the time. Yeah. Um, I think we've probably gone two or three trips in a row before we've seen one again. Yeah. So uh, another question, do you, are you land-based or do you do like, um, live aboard, totally live aboard, yeah. aggressor, yeah. aggressor yeah. fleet. Yes, yeah. exclusively. <laughs> so the aggressor fleet is a, it's a franchise and they have boats in some of the best dive places. And it's a live aboard, so it takes about 18 divers, 16 to 18. You live on the boat, you sleep on the boat, you eat on the boat, and you dive all day. And you can dive up to five dives right. a day. Well, some places you can only do four, but yeah. um, we can do a lot more diving with a lot less work than when we're land-based. Yeah. Yeah, and they pamper you, especially on the oh. night dives, right? Oh, yeah. They pour and warm you water on you your head. You don't have to haul your gear on and off. Yeah. So. It's definitely the way to go. Yep. Yeah. A little more expensive than land-based, but worth it. It's worth it. Yeah, because you can get in five dives, right. whereas land-based, probably three max, right? Yeah. Right. And then occasionally they'll do a night dive. And on the liverboards, you can, you know, if the conditions are okay, you can do night dive every night. Yeah. And do you do on your night dives, do you stay within the 25 to 35 foot range or do you go deeper? Well, go ahead. Uh, not because there's any limit that the boat imposes, but just because that's where a lot of the stuff we want to see is. Right. Plus, when you're doing repetitive diving and, you, and you're doing that for a week, the way you want your profile to be is you want to do your deepest dive in early in the day and then get progressively shallower with your depth. And that has to do with nitrogen absorption and possibility of the bends, decompression sickness. And so by the time the night dive comes around, you want to stay relatively shallower than you've been during the rest of the day. And so as Audrey said, 20, 30, you know, 20 to 40 feet is about as deep. And we dive with computers so that it tracks when you're diving that many right. dives it keeps track of your nitrogen absorption, 
and your oxygen and tells you we, how long you have to be Yeah, safe. we usually die of nitrox also. Yeah. Yeah, so I doubt of nitrox. Yeah, nitrox is higher concentration of oxygen. Less nitrogen. Less nitrogen. I get less headaches on, on nitrox. Really? You don't do rebreathers, do you? No. Me either. Long haul. Did you find that um, the nitrox less headaches? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We've been diving nitrox for a while, and boy, I find that I have more energy at the end of the day um, just because of less nitrogen absorption in the tissues. No, I think it's yeah. just more oxygen. Yeah. Nitrox, so you have to have special training for those of you who aren't divers, it's but it's only like a day or a couple of days, right, before you, you learn how to dive nitrox, and it's pretty it's good. Instead of 21% oxygen, it's about 32% oxygen. So it's enough decrease in the nitrogen that it makes it a little bit safer. As long as you don't go below 100 feet. Right. Right. Because then you get oxygen toxicity problems. So yeah. there's, there's a payoff to everything. Yeah. All right. Any other questions, guys? This was absolutely fantastic. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Obviously, was stunning. Actually, kudos to Audrey. She was the one who kind of organized things and developed the script. So you'll be glad to know. He only gave me 300 shots to look at. <laughs> it was just absolutely, and it's this whole other world that we're exposed to, which is so gorgeous, so fascinating that most of us that don't do that just have no opportunity to really see, you know? And I was fascinated by how something that was less than an inch long, how you even found it and could see it, you know? Um, which I thought was really interesting too, but. Again, you need to know, you need to know your enemy and knowing animal behavior uh, really, really helps. And again, after 35 years, you know how the fish is gonna react. You can actually tell based on its body language, whether it's getting you know, nervous yeah. or skittish or not. Uh, you'll know how it moves. And sometimes what we'll do is literally see a creature and then position ourselves where we know it's going to end up so that we can get the shot. Uh, yeah. Or we have a big fight underwater. Yeah, well, that, <laughs> that happens. Um, did you um, discover this individually before you met this interest or after you met or just how did that come about? Well, I had always wanted to scuba dive ever since I saw Jacques Cousteau and all of that when I was a kid and he felt the same way and he came home from work one day and said this professor that I have if he can scuba dive, we can scuba dive. We didn't have enough money for both of us, so he got certified first, and then I got and I got certified later. And um, then he got uh, the first underwater camera, which I think that worked for about two trips until one day he had trouble clearing his ears and handed me the camera to hold for him, and then I needed a camera too. Yeah, so. the camera was given to me as a gift. I was doing some consulting work. So you were you were married when you both started. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. And we and um, the, we have our daughters are both scuba divers. Our son-in-law realized that to be a member of our family, he had to get certified. So he scuba <laughs> dives. And now our four-year-old uh, grandson can't wait to become a scuba diver. Wow. Um, he's seen his aunt Dana. Our younger daughter is one of the divers for Newport Aquarium. So if you go down there, um, yeah. she dives in the, she's one of the divers in the tank. Um, so he's seen that and now he wants to. Yeah, that was one of the coolest moments as Dana was cleaning and she was in the tank and she waves to people and Jack knew that she was there and seeing, he saw her through the, the glass, she saw him and it was just really touching to see, great. see the two but, of them. Yeah, he's, he's got it all planned out. Yep. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you again, you guys. Very, very, very much. Our pleasure. pleasure. And I have... Next meeting. I, whoops. 
I have one quick thing before we end um, that I forgot to say at the beginning, and it's just a membership reminder, everyone. And I think as you probably saw by our emails uh, this year, because we're not meeting in person or anything like that, the membership for this year is going to be $15. So, um, so renew your memberships. Don't forget about competitions and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, um, and I just can't even tell you how good it is to get together with everybody and just what a perfect presentation to start off our whole our new season. I just, it was just perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey and Brandon. Thank you. Thank you. All right. It was fabulous. fabulous. Later, folks. Great presentation. Thank you. All righty. Good night. Night. Bye-bye.